Split Peoples, it's Carla. I'm here again in my kitchen for another episode of That Sounds So Good. When I start developing a new recipe, I am asking myself three questions. One, is the dish delicious? Two, am I writing the recipe in a way that you can make it and have fabulous results at home? And three, is it beautiful to photograph? And in today's recipe, I nail two out of three. And that third one, um, let's just say, beauty is in the eye of the pea holder. Today, I'm going to make split pea soup with mustard chili sizzle. This is a nostalgic recipe. This is a tasty recipe. It's khaki green. I'm not gonna lie about it, and I'm not gonna hide behind it. It's khaki green, and we're leaning into it. It's delicious so delicious <laughs> it's so easy to make and it's really delicious i think it's beautiful too my split pea soup starts the way all of my soups start which is with the foundation of vegetables for a sofrito they're humble vegetables but when you do the right thing to them they make things um, extra super duper delicious you could chop this by hand of course um, I'm just gonna roughly chop and get everything into the food processor just to give it a head start. Because there's not a huge volume of vegetable for this sofrito, I don't need to separate them out and do them in their own batch in the food processor. They can just all go in there together and break down together. Onion. <laughs> I said it like that. So the reason this recipe is in my book is because split pea soup was a soup I grew up eating. My mom, I'm realizing as an adult, she made a lot of soups and like her soups were good. She made delicious soups. We had pasta fagioli like all the time. We had white bean and escarole soup all the time. She made black bean soup. She's just a super mom. And split pea soup, I have very distinct memories of eating them at home. I also had kind of a transporting split pea soup experience a number of years ago at a restaurant called Roberta's in Bushwick that I ordered for lunch one day and it was just like the most humble thing in a bowl but it was absolutely extraordinarily delicious. Whenever I think about split pea soup I think about my mom and I think about that lunch at Roberta's. All right, so I'm blitzing these to be pretty finely chopped but not pureed. <laughs> You gotta check for carrots. Carrots have a tendency to wanna stay in like a giant hunk when everything else breaks down. So getting the sofrito ready is the first step in the recipe and cooking the sofrito right um, is the first part of the process too. Okay, so this texture looks good. You can see that there's different vegetables in there, but I'm not looking for a ton of texture from the veg. In fact, one of the reasons why I love split pea soup is that it kind of purees itself while it cooks. Just everything really breaks down. Time to cook the sofrito. If you have made my pasta fagioli, you will have made my sofrito. And it starts with the magical pour of olive oil. All good things start with the magical pour of olive oil. Speaking of which, if you like olive oil, like and subscribe to the channel and ring the olive oil bell and get the notifications and never miss a video where I pour olive oil. Because <laughs> that's what I do in every video. All right, I have my beautiful chopped veggies. And I don't know if I've showed this in a while, but if you just dump from the food processor, the blade will fall out in, but there's a little hole in the bottom. I don't want to tell you what it reminds me of, but it just reminds me of a little hole in the bottom. And you can just um, kind of pull that down from the other side and dump your veg in without dumping the blade. Oh, remember how I said there was going to be a rogue carrot? There it is. Every time. I'm keeping him in. It looks like a lot of olive oil to begin with, and this pot is gonna look like very juicy at the beginning, and it's gonna look very bright. I definitely like to salt at the very beginning of the cooking process so that all of this flavor 
is embedded in the vegetable from the very beginning and just becomes one. I will tell you that a lot of people over time have told me that every time they make soup, it's bland, it's watery, it doesn't have body, it doesn't taste that great, it's boring to eat, and the reason is this step is probably not happening. I believe so firmly in the power, the magical power of the sofrito, and it is why soup tastes good. If your soup tastes good, it's because your sofrito was good. If your soup tastes bad, it's because you just did not get down with the sofrito. You gotta get down with your sofrito, and that, process takes time, time to coax out all of the flavor, time to cook off all of this liquid, and that's great, because what do we have in the darkest days of the winter and the March? We have time. You know, it hasn't sprung forward or whatever, it's still, it could be snowing. I'm gonna cover the pot at the beginning. These little dimples on the underside of the Dutch oven are there for a purpose. It's designed um, to capture and trap steam it will drop down everywhere, basting the sofrito with its own liquid. Eventually that liquid will evaporate. So at the beginning, I want a lot of moisture to come out. I want a lot of moisture to come down on the rain shower of sofrito. And then I'm gonna stir and check and, and stir and check. And check and stir. Things are happening. Moisture has cooked off. The color is a little bit more, let's say burnt orange from bright orange, but uh, it's not there yet. A lot less steam, not so drippy, and it's looking really excellent right around the 16 minute mark. What I'm noticing is a deeper color and when I'm scraping the sofrito off to the side, instead of big pools of water collecting there, it just looks like the right amount of olive oil on the bottom of the pan. I'm now gonna spice up my soup. I'm sure of all the family recipes of split pea soup, everybody's got their own way. They've got their own base flavors, um, and these are mine. So I've got fennel seeds. These are whole fennel seeds. I used to get made fun of at Bon Appetit for how much I loved fennel. This is cumin seed. You can replace this with ground cumin. I have the seeds. I'm grinding anyway, so I'm going to use those. I'm really not trying to get them down to a powder. I just want to break the outer hull of the seeds. They're good to go. And I'm also using some ground turmeric. I especially love turmeric with Lentils, I love to put in my sauteed lentils and lentil soup. Delicious together, really earthy, a little spicy, and turmeric also blooms and continues to open up with longer cooking time, so it'll totally transform during the hour and a half that the soup is cooking. It also gives that like deep yellowy orange undertone. The spice is nice. <laughs> this is a ham hock. Ham hock is a smoked pork product. There's not a ton of meat on it, but what is amazing about ham hocks is that they have a lot of cartilage, they have a big bone, and they're smoked, so they deliver also smoky flavor. So there's fat, there's cartilage, there's some meat. If you are a vegetarian, obviously skip this, just add a little bit more oil to replace the fat that's gonna render. This whole outer part is skin. So it's pretty dense and um, it's sort of trapping. But what I want is to make sure that the good fat, the collagen, this inner stuff that's happening has a place to go when it renders. So I just snip down the sides to kind of open up a channel. So I'm gonna warm the hawk up until I see the fat softening a tiny bit and starting to render. I love the flavor of the smoked ham hock. It is mostly about fat and richness, which you can definitely recreate by just adding a little bit more cooking oil. But the smokiness is elusive. The one product that I've seen that I think could be cool and maybe worth seeking out is a smoked soy sauce or smoked tamari. Now that it's warm and sassy and smoky and fatty, I'm going to add the star, <laughs> the green split peas. 
it's a good idea to pick through them. Just make sure you're not adding any tiny rocks. I don't think that happens so much anymore. When was the last time you found a rock in your lentils? But I guess it could happen. I want to coat the lentils with okay. some. Why do you think that these are lentils? Green split peas are lentils. Are they not? I believe that a split pea is a lentil that's been split. It's not a big deal, and I was wrong. A green split pea is a pea, not a lentil. But the reason I keep thinking it's a pea is because of these split peas, which are used for making dal, and they are dal, and they're split, but they're lentils. <laughs> Anyway, every time I said lentil, just replace it with pea. And I'm gonna add some beer. If you don't wanna use beer, but you have some dry cider, dry cider could totally be used. Now it smells like a pub where the specialty is split pea soup. Like a beer bar where they have one thing on the menu and the one thing that they have is split pea soup. That's what it smells like. This place is called Sappy Pappy's Pea Place. <laughs> it's the guy that runs it. He's a pretty salty old bird, but great at making soup. You could drink beer with the soup, and I want to cook off about half of it. The heat can come up a little bit to get us there faster. I've got 10 cups of water. I really am a firm believer in water for soups when you've got a great sofrito and you've got copious amounts of other ingredients that deliver flavor, you make a delicious stock broth in the process of making the soup. And I would prefer to use water over box stock. So if you have a homemade stock, use it, but otherwise just stick with water. This looks, speaking of water, very watery right now, but split peas have a way of getting super starchy breaking into smaller pieces. There's a lot of collagen and fat from the ham hock that is also gonna thicken the soup. Right now, this looks really pretty. There's oranges and browns, and it's just gonna change, right? We're not getting better or worse. We're all changing. The body is always changing. The peas are always changing, and I don't wanna put a value on it. I don't wanna put a judgment on it. It is what it is, and what it is is great. Although the peas have finished their journey, the hawk is like mid journey and needs a little last touch before it can actually be um, consumed by the humans. I shall now go fishing for my ham hawk. Mmm, green. A nice meaty hawk that's pretty much falling apart. That's, that's what we want. Looks like a Loch Ness monster at this point. Easiest to do this after um, it's had a minute to cool down. And a good way to check in the pot is to kind of just go in with a pair of tongs. Of course, I'm impatient, so I'm gonna not wait for it to cool down and it will cool down while I'm messing with it. Wow, it looks cool. <laughs> There's this big bone in the middle. It's not gonna come off in a super clean way. And this is the thing about a ham hock. It seems like such a big meaty thing at the beginning. And then at the end, when you go in to actually take the meat off, you realize there's not that much meat. There's a lot of other stuff. So for the longest time I did what my mom always did, which was just take the meat pieces off and then save the bone um, for stock. And then one day while I was cleaning up my ham hock, I was looking at all of the fat and all of the cartilage and thinking about how delicious those things are. So just kind of as an experiment, I diced up some of the cartilage, called the family over, everybody approved. <laughs> so now I cut it all up. If that thought is does not agree with you, you can just take the meat off and that is totally fine. But this texture, this like bouncy, chewy, springy texture is QQ, which I learned also late in life is a prized texture in Taiwanese cooking. And it's like the texture of boba in boba tea or springy ramen noodles or gummy candy. Like those things are all Q or QQ. And I love that texture a lot. And the ham hock is just QQ to the nines. It's like QQQQQ.
the more cues is the more um, chewy. Anywho, that's a meat hunk. And that's like cartilage or something, tendon, connective tissue. If you've ever had osobuco, you've had some cartilage. Also this way, I just feel like the yield is so much better. <laughs> I'm just leaning into the beauty of the whole thing. I can just see the comments now. They're gonna be like, she lost me at the cartilage part. <laughs> and also to my vegetarian friends who I've tried to support throughout the making of this short video. Um, you just skip ahead, just skip ahead a couple minutes, come back when it's serving time. I didn't say it was all gonna be like roses and Easter bunnies and stuff like that. Like this is, this is real stuff. It's real delicious stuff. 2022, if you're not eating cartilage and connective tissue, like what are you doing? All right, this is very hot, very steamy. Now it's studded with pork nuggets of gold. And there's one more magic step to bring us through. You don't wanna make this spice sizzle until you're really ready to serve. And actually what I'm calling a spice sizzle is an Indian technique called tadka or tarka. It's sometimes called bagar or bagar and sometimes called chonk. So depending on where you're from, I think it has a different word, but the technique is really this act of blooming spices, cooking spices out in hot oil. I'm using ghee because I have it. And I learned how to make this from an Indian chef named Vivek Surti and actually went to his home and his mom showed us how she makes her doll. And her doll is finished with this really bright tadka that had chilies and spices and added this amazing layer of flavor. All right, so definitely have your spices handy when you start. Um, a small pot is best. The mustard seeds may pop. I'm not smelling anything yet, but I'm hearing a lot and seeing a lot. The mustard seeds are going from dark brown to kind of dark gray, and they're definitely crackling and snappling. So as soon as I see a little bit of popping, I'm gonna pull it off the heat, just so the chili flake doesn't burn. Soup's on. The smells are incredible. It's so bright and spicy and mustardy and chili-y. And I have my gorgeous split pea soup. She's perfection. <laughs> and now while the tadka is hot, I'm gonna spoon it over and the interaction of the soup and the spices makes another dash of magic. Split pea is for pretty. It's pea. It's pretty, it's so pretty. <laughs> it's actually, it's beautiful. It's, you know, it's gorgeous. This is why we love pea soup, because of how beautiful it is. 2022, we are done shaming food. We are all about khaki foods and all are welcome. I would say the perfect texture is slowly moving. That's the texture that you want at the end. You wanna put it in a bowl and see it slowly move. Okay, going in. Mm. It's like a chenille blanket, this soup. That's what it is. It is cozy. It's like a fisherman's sweater, but if a fisherman's sweater was made out of cashmere, because fisherman's sweaters are actually extremely uncomfortable. Mm. Well, the phrase that comes to mind at any rate is everything green is gold and this soup is freaking magic.